Luke chapter 17. I'm going to read you a very familiar story. But uh, before we get there, you know, well, most of you know uh, and that I retired in February. And I was telling some guys the other day, I said, it's amazing for a few, for a few, I don't know, month or so, nobody knew I retired. So my phone continued to ring. But then, after it started getting out that I was retired, then suddenly my phone quit ringing. Because you see, for a long time, and you can ask my wife, for a lot of years, I'd have people call me who I might not have seen in years or heard from in years. And they'd say, hey, brother, how are you doing? You know, I'm good. I'm thinking they're checking on me. They'd go, well, yeah, uh, do you know anybody who works down there at Russellville? <laughs> Or you know anybody that works down there at Adkins? Or you know anybody that works down there at Pottsville? See, I was just late, and, and they pulled me over, and, and they gave me a speeding ticket. I said, well, how dare they? Just, and uh, some I could help and some I couldn't, but uh, it seemed like the ones I could help, they didn't call me back anymore till, oh, I don't know, a year or so later. Hey, you know anybody in Dover? <laughs> I was just going through there, and... Uh, but I've noticed that stopped. Nobody seems to need you anymore. Nobody seems to want to call you and just, just visit, you know. And so these people that you helped, you know, they just kind of went about their way. They looked for somebody else to help them. And I thought, how is that in our spiritual walk today? And I said, I see so many people cry out to God in despair. I mean, they have hit rock bottom and they're crying out to God. And then God so graciously helps them. <laughs> and what do they do? As soon as they get back on their feet, okay, God, thanks. I'll see you next mess. They're gone. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. The greatest lesson I have learned in my life is whether we're on the mountain or whether we're in the valley, I want God right there beside me. And I want to hold his hand, and I want to be walking with him. And you see, there's so many that just uses God for relief and with no true gratitude. Have you ever helped somebody who was just truly, truly thankful? You could see it in their eyes with tears rolling down their cheeks, and then you help other people, and they look at you like you owed it to them. We've all seen that. Well, let me tell you something. Without that true gratefulness to God and, that, and that, uh, that attitude, that leads not only to trouble, but I'm going to show you in Scripture where that leads to hell. If you would, turn with me to Luke chapter 17. When you find Luke chapter 17, I'm going to start in verse 11. If you would, stand tonight to honor the reading of God's Word. Very familiar Scripture, but I want to share it with you tonight and look at something that a lot of times I think we read right over. Luke chapter 17, I'm going to start in verse number 11. And it came to pass, as he went to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priest. And it came to pass, as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back with a loud voice, glorified God, and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? There are not found that return to give glory to God save this stranger. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for another beautiful day you've given us. We thank you for another opportunity to come to your house tonight and honor and glorify you. Lord, we thank you so much for the beautiful songs that have been sung and the wonderful testimonies that are given. Lord, we truly owe it all to you. And, Lord, I thank you tonight for your guidance and your, and your love, Lord. And tonight I pray that you'd forgive this vessel, Lord, of my sins and cleanse me with your blood. And tonight I pray that the words that come from this vessel, Lord, will be directly from you. And I pray that the thoughts that, 
that are in this head, Lord, would be from you, Lord. Take total control. And I pray, Lord, that you speak through us, through me, Lord, to us. And, Lord, that you open up our ears of our heart and our mind and that we would take your word and we would apply it to our lives and grow closer to you and be what you've called us to be so that you could use us, Lord, to reach others and to lead them to you. And in Jesus' precious name, his church prayed. Amen. I want you to focus on the last part of this verse. Now, I want you to understand you, how bad leprosy was during this time. If you were a leper, you were unclean. And you had to announce that. Anytime you come into a town, you'd have to yell out, unclean, unclean. Now, let me tell you something, folks. That's kind of like eating at the lunch table at school by yourself. Nobody wanting to hang out with you. That is, they would run from you and understandably so they but you had to announce that you were unclean so these 10 lepers they were suffering folks their life was miserable and they see Jesus and they cry out to him now this is what I don't want you to miss folks it wasn't just like Jesus we kind of need you over here could you intervene maybe a little bit these men were at rock bottom. They were lepers. Their lives pretty much was over. They were doomed to isolation. And folks, when it says they lifted up their voices, may I put that another way? Folks, they yelled. They yelled at God. We need you, Jesus. And what did he tell them to do? He said, go and show yourselves to the priests. And they turned, and they did what he said, and they started going to the priest. And then they realized, holy smokes, we're healed. They did exactly, nine of them, did exactly what I said we see all the time. They didn't even turn around and thank God. They took off. We'll see you next mess, God. But one man, do you believe, do you believe numbers are important in the Bible? <laughs> oh, yeah. How many lepers? Ten. How many come back? One. What percent is that? Ten. <laughs> I'll just leave that where it is right now. But he turned around. Now listen to what, because he fell at Jesus' feet, but listen to what Jesus told him. This is what I don't want us to miss tonight. Number 19. And he said, now remember, they were all healed, right? And he said unto him, arise, go thy way, Thy faith has made thee whole. Now, wait a minute. Preacher, you said you just read they were all cleansed. What does this mean, thy faith has made thee whole? Not only was he clean of leprosy, his soul was saved. Why was his soul saved? Because he turned and thanked God and believed in God. The other nine believed in the miracle. This can get pretty deep pretty quick, folks, but stay with me. They believed in the miracle. They believed in what just happened. They did not believe in the God who just done it because they didn't even thank him. Folks, let me ask you something. These people that I knew, I'd known them all my life. Did they really care about me? Were they really calling me to check on me? Or were they calling me to get them out of something? They were calling me to get them out of something. They could care less when they called me what my health was. You know, if they would have called me and said, hey, how are you doing? I said, oh, not good. You know, I had a heart attack. I probably got about two weeks to live. I guarantee you the next sentence go, well, before you go, <laughs> do you know anybody in Pottsville? Their care was them. These nine, nine out of ten, folks, that's 90%. Nine out of ten did not care about Jesus. They cared about what he could do for them. You remember when he fed the 5,000, why did they follow him? And he told them, you didn't follow me because of the miracle. You followed me because you're hungry. Mm. We're going to get more into that in just a minute. But he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith. Stop right there. How did Jesus know that one had faith and the other nine didn't? What did he do to show Jesus that he had faith? He stopped 
and he turned around and he fell at Jesus' feet. He knew who he needed to thank. He knew. And folks, let me tell you something tonight. You are blessed because of Jesus Christ. You are not blessed because of your intelligence. You are not blessed because of your strength. You are blessed because of Jesus Christ. Amen. I talked to my brother the other night and he likes to do floor work. But he said it's hard on his knees. And I was thinking, good Lord, if I ever helped him, he'd have to pick me up off the floor. Because I got down in the floor today helping with the Christmas tree, and I thought I was going to have to get a crane in there to get me up. I couldn't get up. But, folks, it's not in my own strength that I can stand in front of you tonight. It is in God's strength. And I'm telling you tonight, we have to, I'm jumping a little ahead, but this is so important. We must come to the end of ourselves before we can meet God. Amen? That's pretty weak on the amens. Let me reiterate. And men, we're worse. I'm going I'm to go ahead and jump out on that limb. We depend on ourselves way too much. Amen? I'm a man. As, as Tim Allen, ooh, 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 you know, I visit. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Uh, no. You know what? Ask my wife. What are you, what are you shaking your head for? <laughs> she knows. If you want it fixed, don't call me. Now, let me take that back. I know a lot of people. I know a lot of people that can fix things. That's not my specialty. I always have parts left over. And if I've got a picture, I can get close. But you can ask my wife. Please do. Not yet, not yet. Hold that, amen. When I started sitting down and praying before I started doing it, I got a lot better. Amen? And I'm a little embarrassed to tell you, and she'd tell you, used to, things would fly away from me. Tools. Uh, I had a temper. I had to give that to God. Amen? Y'all can quit whispering. I can see you. But if I will stop and, and listen to me, uh, this is spiritual now. If I will quit relying on myself, and allow Jesus Christ, to allow Jesus and the Holy Spirit to operate through me. The, the Holy Spirit lives in us, amen? When we got saved, the Bible says the Holy Spirit indwells us. If I will surrender to the Holy Spirit, just stop, just for a few, I have found this out. Anybody else in here wake up and you start thinking about everything you've got to do during the day? I am the world's worst. And I'll think, well, I've got this much time to do this, this much time to do that. You know what I have found? If I will stop, go in there, read my Bible without thinking about anything, and just worship him and praise him, I can get so much more done in a day. Do y'all believe that God's clock is different than ours? <laughs> Amen. Just like I told y'all last week on tithing, do you believe a God with a dollar? If you trust God with your dollar, you can go a lot farther than you can without God with $100. Hey, God's math isn't like ours, amen? God is control, and all he's looking for from us is for us to trust him. And men, that's why I say we're a little worse, because we've been raised, on one hand, we are supposed to be the leaders in our home, amen? The Bible's very clear about that. We're to be the spiritual leaders in our home, we're to be the spiritual leaders in our church, we're to be the spiritual leaders. And what that means, and I know what some of us, and even me at some times, you know, that doesn't mean I recline my recliner. Woman, get me something to eat, and I'd like a drink. If y'all want to try that, go ahead. I don't suggest it. Uh, but what that means is, all, ser all kidding aside, it is my responsibility in my home to be the first to pray, the first to read, the first to forgive, the first to admit I need God. Amen? Folks, Brother Brian and me has had several talks. And since he's sitting here, I'll share this. Brother Brian tries to put me somewhere I don't belong. And I've tried to tell him I don't want to be there. Folks, all of us are in the same boat. Amen? All of us are men and women, brothers and sisters in the flesh, and we need Jesus Christ. 
And my Bible tells me that we cannot live in the flesh. We must be born again. Now, folks, I'm going to tell you something. I know uh, I've heard Adrian Rogers say this, and, and, it, and it's so true. You know, if, if you call me at 2 o'clock in the morning and I answer the phone, I'm probably asleep. Preachers sleep. And you can ask my wife, preachers get in bad moods. Preachers are crabby. Uh, preachers gripe. Preachers moan. Preachers groan. Preachers fail God. Anybody in here in that same boat with me? Anybody else fall short? Folks, I wish I was holy. But I fall short of the glory of God far, new, far too many times, especially for a pastor. But it is, it is the fact that I realize that that drives me. It is the fact that I realize that that drives me to read his word. It's the fact that I realize that that drives me to pray. It's the fact that I realize that that I'm up in the morning calling out your name to Jesus Christ. It's because <coughs> I know in my own power I will fail. Amen? I can't do it on my own. I come up short. And folks, there are people that will portray to you that they're sinless almost. Can I tell you, can I be perfectly honest? They're lost. And they're the hardest ones to reach because they think they're okay. But folks, the Spirit of God is not dwelling in them if they have that attitude. Because the closer I get to God, and I guarantee you the closer you get to God, the more we realize we need God. Amen? But you see, we've got to come to the end of ourselves. Quit relying on ourselves to truly find God. You know, one of my favorite verses is Psalms 91.1. He who dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Folks, that's where I want to be. Isn't that where you want to be? Under the shadow of God? I've heard it. I've never heard him preach it, but I've heard people talk about Brother Larry Don preaching, saying, I want to walk so close with God that Satan's afraid to swing at me because he's afraid he'll hit God. That's another way of putting it. But I want to walk with God. And to do that, I must come to the end of myself. And folks, we got to take ourselves off our throne. And if you think people aren't putting themselves on their throne, on their personal throne where God belongs, let me tell you where to look. Have you a gander at what they call Facebook? If you want to see people that put themselves on their own throne, get you a look at that. Because what does that, if, <clears throat> I hadn't been on Facebook for a while, so this, this is free. Uh, like I heard y'all talking this morning, I heard Sister Frankie teach this morning. If you put a picture on there and it says, well, I've lost 20, but I've had put 10 back on. What are you asking people to tell you? How good you look. Well, I wonder what would happen if everybody on Facebook took a pill and had to be honest. Oh, I thought you'd gain 30. Whoop. Or uh, trying this new makeup, what do you think? <clears throat> no, that ain't working. Or I've been working out the gym, what do you think? Go back to eating. It ain't working. And I heard y'all talking about, uh, oh, I wish I could remember the term, uh, where you're bragging but you're not trying to... Uh, Humble bragging, thank you. Boy, I, Miss Frank, you don't know how bad I was chewing my tongue off out there this morning. Humble bragging. You might as well just rename Facebook Humble Bragging. Because I cannot, let me tell you something. And, and Brother Rick will chuckle at this because him and Jeannie got me on this because we preached about this one time. I love every one of y'all. But let me be honest with you. I don't care at all what you have for breakfast. You don't have to put a picture unless you're inviting me over. And then I do care. But they went on vacation, and they would text me every time they ate breakfast and showed me a picture. So I'm careful what I say now. But, but I've seen people humble bragging. And, I, and I'm just going to make this up, but it ain't too much of a stretch. God just really blessed. He just, I just really love the way he uses my child. My child went five for six yesterday with four home runs and 30 RBIs. God's just really using him. Really. <laughs> what 
why don't you just come out and say, boy, my kid's a heck of a ball player? Because that's what you just did. You just threw God in there to, uh, you didn't mean it. You just threw God in there to legalize your bragging. And folks, may I tell you something? <laughs> ah, never mind, I'll leave that alone. But we've got to come to the end of ourselves. Get over it. The whole world does not revolve around us. Amen? You know, when I retired, I was pretty sure the drug traffickers were just going to shut down. They were going to say, you know what? Tony's gone now. There ain't no use us even selling dope anymore. <laughs> I don't think they got the message. I think they're still selling it. I will say this. There ain't as many people buying it now that I'm gone, but that's a different story. But, uh, and I told somebody, I said, you know what? I said, when I leave this walk of life, if I can have as many people think of me as a godly person as those people think of me as a narcotics officer, I will have done my job. If I can be as well known for preaching God's word as I was in that community for enforcing the narcotics laws, you know, I thought to myself, what a blessing it would be. And, and the guys always, they would have such a good time with me and they'd laugh. We went down to Indian Hills Apartments one day and we just got, all we had got was some information that they were selling drugs down there. So we just, we're just going to stroll up there and have a chat with them and knock on the door and you hear, you know, they think we're stupid, like we're deaf. You hear everybody running through there, just, so, you know, so you know they're in there. And so, knock again. Who is it? I said, Tony. And they go, Haley? And I said, yep. Silence. They wouldn't even open the door, you know, and you're just like, so Chad and them there behind me and they're just rolling. And I said, hopefully someday I can be known that way for being godly and, and sharing the word because, folks, I've failed so many years to do that. But one day in my pickup truck, I come to the end of myself. I realized I can't do it. I can't be the husband, I can't be the daddy, I can't be anything that I need to be without God. And in order for me to let God have control of my life, I had to take myself out. Have you seen these bumper stickers that says, God's my co-pilot? You got problems. You need to get out of the driver's seat. God needs to be your pilot. You see, Once we come to the end of ourselves and we start seeking God, can I tell you a secret? He's waiting on us. He's been waiting on us. Acts chapter 17, verse 27, that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. Folks, I want to paint a picture for you tonight. of what it means like to feel for God. There's people in this room that have went through things in their life that they had to feel for God. And I would almost bet that the majority of us in here has been at a place in our life before where we were reaching and feeling for God. I don't have, you know my testimony, and you know my story, and you know how I came to preach. But I can tell you one thing. That day, in that yard, in front of that old rock garage, as I was on my knees, and it felt, folks, I could not breathe. My chest would not go in, it would not go out. I could not breathe. The weight that was crushing me. I did not know at the time 
Why such, why God? Because I thought, you know, God, I'm doing so much better. I'm reading your word. I'm praying. I'm doing better. I did not know what the crushing was for at that time. But folks, let me tell you something. If you are being crushed by God, there is a reason. Hold on to it because don't waste your suffering. Amen. We go through trials. Why? Because God makes us stronger. I did not know within just a short time that I would preach the first message I ever preached. I did not know in a short time that God would call me to pastor. I did not know why I was feeling the pain. I did not know. All I thought was I had failed my dad and he was burning in hell because I did not share the scripture with him. That's all I knew at that time. And folks, I pray with everything in me that you never feel that. Unless that's what it takes to get you to seek God. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. Cancer is a horrible thing. But if it drives you to God, it's a blessing. Diabetes is a horrible thing. But if it drives you to God, it is a blessing. Amen? I have heard testimony in this church that because of a man got cancer, he not only led him to Christ, but his family. Amen? Folks, mm. This world is not our home. We are just passing through. Amen. And folks, is, not, is it not going faster than we ever imagined? The mayor always comes in here. He's singing ho, ho, ho. And I'm trying to tell him we ain't even had Thanksgiving. But he's ready for Christmas. Folks, I'm here to tell you, it seems like it was just Thanksgiving last year. And it blows my mind. The, the Sunday after Thanksgiving, seven years ago, is the first time we... We came here. Seven years. Holy smokes. I was 20. That <laughs> Y'all caught that, didn't you? I was 20, plus some. But I guess Cass was 17 and Molly was 14. That just blows my mind. How long and how quick it has been. But, talking about struggles, I want you to know there are some struggles that God allows in our life, amen, for a reason. But did you also know there's some struggles that we cause in our life that he never wants us to, you know, I have seen people, and I've seen this illustrated so many times, where, where people will bring their struggles and trials to the altar and give it to God and get up and walk away and just a short time later, Come back and pick up the same struggles and the same trials. Amen? God does not want that. There's some struggles that God uses to strengthen us. If you're like me, we, I bring on some struggles myself. Either out of stubbornness, stupidness, uh, whatever. And God watches me struggle with that, wanting me to lay it down, wanting me to give it to him. But because my focus or my desire is on me or other things than him, and a lot, a lot of times, folks, it's money, it's health, he's, he's wanting me to lay that down and seek him. I'm going to give you tonight the secret to a blessed life. How many tonight know a blessed life's not money? Amen. Let me tell you something. This is not in the sermon, but this is just a bonus. You know, John 10.10 10 tells us that the thief comes not but to steal, to kill, and destroy. And Jesus says, but I come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Have you ever looked that word up? Abundant means overflowing. You know what he does not say right there? That I come that you might have life and you might have it more affluently. What's affluent? Great wealth. May I give you a perfect example of that? I thought as that scripture rolled through my head, there's two times in my life that really stick out in my mind. And when I say time, I mean a period in my life that I experienced abundant life. I can remember as a child spending many, many afternoons with my grandma my grandpa, my mama, my uncle, and my brother all gathered around under a big shade tree and a rock table that stayed out behind their house. We had so much fun there. 
so many good visits. And we had, and you know, there's, and this is just a bonus, but any of y'all know Bus Rye? Y'all remember him? He used to travel around, I believe, and sell insurance. And him and my grandpa were big buddies, and he'd always come up, and I remember he'd give them fly swats, <laughs> because I've seen them fly swats. <laughs> and it said, you know, it'd say, elect bus ride with it. Well, any day, anyway. I remember being out there one day, and this is just pure bonus material for y'all. I'm not charging y'all for this or nothing. This is just free. But we was out there one day, and grandpa would play catch with me. And when I was little, and my arm, before surgeries, I could throw decently hard. And so, Grandpa, we'd play catch with a tennis ball. And we were out there playing catch. And Grandpa had the glove on, and Bus pulled up. And Bus was always friendly, you know, and he, he'd talk and everything. And he said, Benny, you getting soft, son? You got to use a glove to catch a tennis ball? He said, give her here, son. And I looked over at Grandpa, and he said, go ahead. And so I cut loose with it. It went right between Buss's hands and hit him right in Adam's apple. He choked around there for a minute. Hit, hit, cough, hit. He said, hit, give me that glove, Benny. <laughs> but, out, but out there at that rock table, I've been chased by a chicken with no head. And I didn't think I was fast, but I outrun that thing. I learned so much at that table. I learned what family was. I learned what love was. And then just the other night I thought, I felt like the richest man in the world because we were sitting in the living room, Cass and Corey, Molly and Noah and Jen and me. I wasn't saying a thing, I was just listening. Thanking God. I said, this is what it's about. I'm the richest man alive. I don't, have, I don't have a lot of money, but I've got what matters. Folks, money's not what makes you happy. God is what makes you happy. And he blesses us with our family and our church family. And folks, we are blessed above measure with a wonderful church family. And I am so glad I see y'all getting together outside and starting to, to unite. And folks, that is so important in this day and time. But listen, this is the secret. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now, you've got to read before that verse to know what all these things are. But we're talking about food and clothes and all that stuff. You don't have to be materialistic in this world. Matter of fact, mater you, you can't be materialistic in this world. It says you cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon is the love of things. But God says, seek me. Seek me, child. And I will give you what you need. Uh-oh. Preacher, what'd you say? I said he gives us what we need. Not necessarily what we want. But you remember this morning when I said we become a new creature? Isn't it amazing how after you gave your heart and soul to Jesus Christ, your wants changed? Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Before I close in the book of John tonight and explain to you more about Jesus, I want you to know if you will diligently seek God. Folks, I'm not telling you that your water's not going to get rough. I'm not telling you that your boat ain't going to rock. I'm not going to tell you that there's not going to be a fire. But you hear me tonight. The Bible promises us if we will diligently seek God, the water will not overflow us, and we will walk through the fire, and it will not even singe us. Amen? He will deliver us. We, you will have tough times. Folks, I heard the Sunday school lesson this morning, and, and what really bothered me is that, is that story up front is going on in churches today. There are people saying, if you're sick, it's because you don't have enough faith. 
If you've done this or done this because you don't have enough faith. Folks, we live in a fallen world. Amen? We live in a world that is run by the prince of the air who is Satan. Folks, but there is coming a day. Oh, there is coming a day when Jesus Christ is going to step out and with the voice of the archangel and the, and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we who are alive and remain, we shall be caught up in the air to be with them and there forever be with Jesus. Amen? Amen. And Satan will be in the lake of fire where he deserves to be. But right now, you don't let anybody cause you to have a faith failure. If you love somebody and they've been diagnosed with cancer and you pray, can God heal them? Amen. He can. Sometimes, sometimes, church, he chooses to heal them by bringing them home. Amen? Amen. You, do you think for one moment Sister Carolyn would come back today if she could? No way. I think about my grandma all the time, how she loved us and everything. And folks, I know she's with Jesus. And if, she, if you gave her the opportunity right now to come back, I mean, she stayed alive two years because of Cassidy. Period. I know she did. If you gave her the chance to come back today and meet Molly and see it, she'd say, no, I'll wait up here. Now, folks, that's pretty impressive. Amen? Our rewards are not down here. Our home is not down here. Friends, we are going home. He is trying to prepare us. He says, but he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Let me tell you this. Our government, as far as I can tell, has went to hell. They are controlled by the devil. Our nation is nothing what it used to be. We were formed a Christian nation and now we have turned our back on God and we will suffer. But listen to me. They can do what they want to. And if this group right here, if we will diligently seek God and serve Him, let me give you a promise we will be taken care of. Amen? And we will not be begging bread. God will provide. Now, we may not pull up in a new GMC 3500, but we'll pull up. Amen? He will get us there. But you see, I want to, I want to end with this story in John chapter 4. <laughs> Because, you see, the world cannot see and the world cannot understand the Holy Spirit. Amen? The world cannot see and the world cannot understand Jesus our fa and our Father. Amen? Because why? We are told in the Bible that they are spirit. The world is flesh. Amen? And the Bible says that we have to be born again. That's See, all this ties together. We can't live in the flesh and know God. Amen? So now that we've been born again, the world doesn't understand us. Why do you think God said, hey, the world's going to hate you, but they hated me first? Folks, if the world don't hate us, we're one of them. Amen? If they don't see a difference in us and in them, we're one of them. But listen to this. Now, I want to set, set the story for you just a little bit. Jesus has just met the woman at the well. He has just revealed himself to her as the Savior. And she was excited. You remember? She was so excited that she came there that day to fill her water pot. She left her water pot and went back to tell everybody about Jesus. That's a sermon for another day, folks. But that's how good God is, that he makes us forget our earthly focus and seek him. But now, Jesus has been gone a long time. They've been walking and, 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 and preaching, and they've covered a lot of ground. And, and he, remember, he must go through Samaria. And so he had went through Samaria, and, and he'd met this woman. And so Jesus, has, it's been a lot of days, and he's been tired. That's where we're at now. Let me pick it up in John chapter 4, verse 30. Then they went out of the city and came unto him. That's the disciples. In the, in the mean, while his disciples prayed to him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Whew. 
hoax. If we could just wrap our minds around that right there. First of all, the disciples were looking what? In the flesh. They said, Jesus, you've been out here a long time. You need to eat. You're going to, you know, you, you're tired. Folks, we must remove our vision from the flesh and turn it. What did Jesus say? I have meat that you have no idea about. At that time, what was he, who was he speaking of? Holy Spirit. You do realize that after Jesus was baptized by John, the Holy Spirit indwelled Jesus. Amen? The Bible says he came down like a dove. And the voice from heaven said, This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. You know what happened after he got filled with the Holy Spirit? He turned the water into wine. And the miracles began. So, never, under, never, never doubt that Jesus was totally God when he was here. But he was totally man. Amen? And the Holy Spirit was that meat that Jesus had to eat that the disciples did at this time did not know about. They would shortly. You see, when we've reached what we think is the end, that we can go no farther, or that the waves we're facing can't get any higher, or another bill shows up in the mailbox, and we're just like, God, I can't do this. Where is it going to come from? Hit your knees. Pray and trust God and watch him work. Amen? He loves to show up when we can't see no way out. Uh, there was a line in a song I was going to try to tell you, but now I can't remember it. I know it. Uh, maybe he'll help me with my memory. But anyway, that's like, you know, I tell you all the time, faith is like film. It's developed in the dark. It's those dark times when you trust God and he delivers us. And folks, if you're like me, sometimes he has to remind me because sometimes I forget how much he's done for me. Sometimes I forget about the last dark time. But folks, I'm telling you, he's so good. So now, if you're here tonight and you're saved, you have that meat that the world does not understand. The Holy Spirit is inside you. He directs us, he protects us, he guides us, he gives us wisdom that the world cannot understand and the world cannot have because the world is flesh and the Holy Spirit is spirit. God is spirit. Why does God tell us that we must worship him in spirit and truth? We cannot worship him in flesh. And folks, may I say, I see a whole lot of church services where people are worshiping God in the flesh. It is not biblical. And the more I see, I saw a video of it today, and it disturbs me. And in the past, before I was a pastor, I, did, I could just let it go. But now I'm a pastor, and he calls me to stand for him and, and, and preach the word of God to you. And folks, out of control worship service, that's not of God. And they'll say the spirit moved, you know, I'm not going to get too much into it, but what I'm going to tell you is God is not the author of confusion. Amen? God will be very clear. God, we are not to be driven by our emotions. If, you're, if your emotions drive your decision to serve God, it will not last. I cannot say that any clearer. Because, you know, some of these services, they like to play the music and they like to build this fever pitch up and really get the tears flowing and get you feeling, you know, and, and get all this stuff going. And then people just, you know, they come to the altar and they're crying. And then the next day they walk out and they don't even remember even visiting with God. Here's why it doesn't last. What emotion have you had in your life that's lasted more than, well, I better be careful with some of you. <laughs> Because anger is an emotion. <laughs> but uh, how many of you just wake up on Monday and you're happy all the way till next Sunday? Just, well, I'm just roses. Now, I'm not saying joy. Uh, we're to have joy. I'm talking about happy. Ken, you look happy right now. 
I owe him one. And by the way, I am glad that I have a church that understands me and knows how to deal with me. I was sitting by Sister Diane before while they were singing, and I leaned over and I said, Sister Diane, I said, I bet you're not used to sitting next to short people. Oh, it gets better. Without missing a beat, she goes, yeah, I'm used to sitting next to my grandchildren. <laughs> you see, I'm about the size of a Stanek baby. Uh, but now, see, it's good to laugh, isn't it? And I think God's people, I think we should do more of it. We should have joy in our heart. But now, here's what I'm asking you. How many of you go in there and the dryer quits and you go, praise God. Or you go out there and the tires, you got a flat tire. Woo, yeah. All right, I got me a flat tire. Or I thought of Brother Tommy. Or you, you smoke for 60 years and now the doctor tells you you got to quit. Yeah, Doc, I'm looking forward to that. Any of you have bad things happen to you? Does it make you happy? No. But listen to me. And this is, I want to close with this. Happy don't last. Amen? Emotions don't last. Can you remember a time in your life when you were so sad, you were heartbroken, a loss of a loved one or something like that, and you, you were crushed? What helped heal that? Time and God. Now, we're still sad some. But it's not like it was, is it? Because he healed us. But now listen to me. Let me turn it spiritual for just a second. If the fever pitches up and emotion drives you to what you think is an experience with God and a decision, what happens to that decision when that emotion leaves? The decision leaves. But, and this is why I'm not a fan of music being played at the altar call. It's not an emotional decision. It is a life-altering decision, and you need to make it from the bottom of your feet to the top of your head with everything in you. I'm tired of the life I'm living, and I need Jesus. You don't need to be emotionally driven, but now listen to me. Once you make that decision, oh, then the emotions will pour through you because you realize how much you need Jesus Christ. Amen? And that's the reason, folks, I tell you every week, pray for each other because you have no idea what each other's going through. So let's keep it. Let's be ground, rooted and grounded is what the word calls it. And I'm not saying don't be emotional because, folks, I've been emotional a lot lately because my heart's been broke. But I've got joy in my heart because I see God moving. Anybody else see God working in this church? I certainly do. And I see God working in your lives. I see God working in my life. I see God working. I see young people he's brought to this church who's on fire for God. I see he's brought new individuals in with such giving hearts. And then they joined you who were already here who I couldn't have asked for a more loving, giving people. We just keep getting stronger, amen? But there's a reason. We are in a battle, amen? And every one of us came here tonight. We drove by people who are lost and living in this world without Jesus Christ, and he's calling us. He's telling us the harvest is ripe, church, get out there. So here's what we do. No matter whether you're happy, no matter whether you're sad, no matter whether you're mad, have joy in your heart and go about God's will. And that's what he's saying. The meat that I have is doing God's will. Folks, if we will do God's will, we will walk and not grow weary. Amen? That's all I'm asking tonight. Let's do God's will and see where he leads us. If you would, stand with me all over this building. As you bow your heads... I want you to honestly tonight evaluate your heart. Is it where it needs to be with God? Have you asked Jesus Christ into your life? Have you repented of your sins? Are you doing the best you can to live for him? Is he the center of your life? He has to be 
the center of your life. I can't make my wife, I can't make my children, I can't make this church, I can't make any of that the top priority in my life. If I'm to be who I've got to be for him, he has to be the top priority in my life. Is he the top priority in your life tonight? If he's not, I, I can tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt, he's knocking on your heart's door. And he's telling you, child, come to me. If you're tonight, I don't know why this is in my heart, but if there's something in your heart that you can't turn loose of tonight, if there's unforgiveness in your heart for somebody, I he's telling me to let you know tonight you're killing yourself with that. Like the old saying goes, you're drinking poison expecting them to die. Forgiveness was granted to you by God. Now he is requiring that we grant it to others. If you have an unforgiving heart tonight about anything, he's, he's asking you to lay it down. Give it to him. Let him handle the justice. Let him handle. And folks, I'm telling you right now, if you will forgive tonight, I don't know what it is or who it is, but if you will forgive, it will feel like a weight is lifted off of you and you will begin to see the hand of God move not only in you but in your family and in your neighbors. So if there's something tonight you need to let go, let go. Every eye is closed, every head is bowed right now with no one looking around. I'm not going to let this go because I feel it too important. If you're in here tonight and you're struggling with unforgiveness, just raise your hand up and down real quick, and I'm not going to call your name out. Folks, there's hands going up all over this room. Let me tell you something. We got to let that go. No matter what they have done to you, no matter what they've done to us, no matter what they've done, let it go tonight. Jesus is saying, I held nothing against you as I, ha as I hung on that cross. And as, your, as my child, you are to hold nothing against anybody. I know it's tough, church. I know it's tough. But we've got to let it go. Lay it down tonight so you can have joy in your heart and God can use you. And not only that, maybe you're holding a blessing back. Un if you've got unforgiveness in your heart, you realize you're, you're keeping God from working in your life. Maybe you're praying for something, but with that unforgiveness in your heart, you realize God can't hear you for that sin. You must clear that out for, so God can hear you. Let it go tonight, church. I saw way too many hands. We've got to let it go. And that is obviously why he brought it to our attention tonight. He's saying, lay it down. If there's anything at all tonight you want to pray about, we'll pray.